Rosetta spacecraft to get to this comet, it's very hard because the comet is going very, very fast relative to the Earth, hundreds of thousands of kilometers an hour. So we had to fly by Mars once to help get an assist, and we had to fly by Earth four times. And it took so long that you just saw that part with the comet flying by. It took 10 years. In the 10 years, four years into it, Jerry M. Ross Menkel already flew by the Earth, so we missed it once. And we're catching it on the second time around here. We arrived at the comet and entered in orbit in August 2014. We came out of hibernation in, in January 2014. And you can see the tail coming out now. It's a very exciting time. The closest approach is in, in this next month. So we expect lots of fun science results from it. So just to give you a little bit of remembering of what it was like in 2004 when we launched Curium on Grasmenko, this was your cell phone. Text messaging was pretty hard. Only, as far as I could tell, only teenagers could do it with like one finger, like my niece. This was the pop, pop pop artist, Britney Spears. How many people remember Britney Spears? Okay, now to really make everybody feel old. And then this guy in his Harvard dorm room said, I'm going to launch a website. It was the Facebook. Okay, so that's how long the, the Rosetta mission has been flying in space to get to this comet. And if you think about how long it took to design this mission and get it approved and everything, it's more, much more than a decade, even longer than that. So Rosetta is one of the most challenging space missions in history. I already said it's a six billion kilometer cruise taking 10 years. In case you're counting, that's enough to go around the Earth 150,000 times. It was in hibernation two and a half years because it went too far from the sun for its solar panels to power it. That was not intentional. Originally, they were supposed to go to a different comet, and they had a launch vehicle problem, so they had to look for a new comet, and the spacecraft was not necessarily designed to hibernate. They said, oh, we can get to this comet. Uh, can we hibernate? The engineer said, uh, maybe. So we were all very, very excited in January 2014 when the spacecraft came out of hibernation fully functional. It's amazing. Uh, we're rendezvousing with a comet that's only four kilometers in diameter, uh, traveling at 135,000 kilometers per hour. That's why we had to do all those funny trajectories. And at our closest approach, the spacecraft was orbiting the comet or flying by only 10 kilometers from the comet. So actually, only five times more than the radius of the comet were we flying above it. Okay? Uh, the comet is constantly changing. It's getting more active as we get closer to the sun. For the lander, the landing environment, we really have no idea. I'll show some before and after, after pictures. You already saw one in the video. And we've never before orbited such a low gravity body, such as Trium of Grasso There are 26 instruments on both the lander and orbiters, one mission. Over 2,000 people have worked on the Rosetta mission. And the total mission cost is about 1.3 billion euros. I did a back of napkin calculation the first day of the conference. That's about the research budget of the 1,400 attendees for one year. So I want to emphasize this is a European Space Agency mission, my poor Spanish aside. Uh, and NASA is thrilled to be a part of this, contributing several instruments as well as this planning software. And this is true exploration of the unknown. I'll be showing you some of the, the exciting things we've learned. So just a little bit of context, because when I would tell people, ah, we're going to a four kilometer object, they think, oh, that's tiny. That's like going to a space drop. Well, those of you who are familiar with Rome, this is Turiyama Grasimeko on top of Rome. Uh, since this is a European mission, I only have European examples. Uh, here's London, it's roughly between Big Ben and the Tower of London would be the width. Oops. And then, of course, Madrid, since ESAC, the planning center, is in Madrid. Uh, it's roughly distant from the Palacio Real to the Plaza de Toros. So these are some of the recent images uh, from, from uh, the Rosetta Orbiter. And as you can see, this comet looks nothing like those, that video I showed you. That's not because we were trying to make a bad video. It's because we had no idea. Uh, the comet is, in fact, uh, looks like it's two different objects. That's an object that's a topic of quite a bit of controversy 
uh, among the scientists is it what's called a contact binary, which is there were two objects in the Kuiper belt or the Jupiter belt that came together with just the right speed so that they would stay to each other through gravitational attraction. Um, if they come together too fast, they actually fly off of each other. Uh, this is actually some zoom-ins uh, of the landing site that we were trying to land on uh, with the Osiris narrow-angle camera. Uh, this is a selfie taken by the Chiba camera on the lander. This is the solar panel with the comet in the background. Uh, nowadays, it's quite in the vogue for the Mars rovers to take selfies. This was a lovely side effect of the fact that the lander had a camera and it could take test images that happened to have the orbiter uh, in the field of view. Keep in mind, in 2000, when the spacecraft was designed, selfies weren't such a big deal. Uh, so, uh, in November, sorry, November, we have the, the lander delivery. This is actually the lander dropping away from the orbiter as imaged by the uh, OSIRIS visible camera. This is actually the trajectory as imaged by OSIRIS as it's falling towards the space, falling towards the nucleus. Now, keep in mind that Curiamount Gerasimenko is very small, only four kilometers, and it's much less dense than a planet. So it's much less dense, so less dense that it would float in water. Okay? And so when we dropped it towards the, uh, when we dropped the lander towards the nucleus, it's as if it had one gram of weight. That's the gravitational attraction. And it was falling towards the nucleus. Uh, those of you who followed in the news, there's a very interesting story to tell about the lander. This is actually a series of images showing the lander as it approaches the nucleus. Here's the Philae lander, this is Osiris imagery. This is about five minutes later. This is another four minutes later. This is the first touchdown point. This is the before and after. Note there's a little mark there where the lander hit and bounced. And here's the, <coughs> there the next image saying, goodbye, nucleus. Uh, and just in case you don't believe that we actually did the planning, I actually brought up uh, most of the pre-lander plans were actually done on this laptop. This is actually the delivered plan, and these are the activities, the OSIRIS lander movies, and then this is the lander verification that had the different touchdown. Those are the literal activities that you saw the imagery from. So as Fred Jansen, who was the mission manager at the time, said, we got not one landing, but three landings for the price of one. What happened is the final lander hit, and the surface of the comet was about three orders of magnitude harder than we expected. Okay? So there were two mechanisms in the lander designed to secure it to the comet. First of all, there is a set of screws on the three legs, and the legs absorb the shock. They have a, a, a shock absorption system, and those screws are supposed to screw in on contact. Second of all, there's a set of harpoons that fire from the base of the lander, and that are, they're supposed to also, as a second mechanism, secure the lander. Unfortunately, because the lander was much, the, sorry, the nucleus was much harder than we thought, none of those secured the lander. In addition to that, uh, the lander has a flywheel in it that's spinning, so that when it's dropping towards the nucleus, it doesn't tumble. Unfortunately, in order to conserve power, the flight software on the lander says, oh, after the first contact, I turn that flywheel off quickly to save power. So, after the first bump, it flew up here, and now it's tumbling. And so, now it's even harder to make a successful landing. Uh, just in context, this is a, a one hour and 50 minute hop here between the first and second contact. This is on a nucleus with a uh, rotational period of 12 hours and 43 minutes. So that's the equivalent of, roughly speaking, one sixth of a rotation, okay, underneath as we're, land, as we're trying to land. The second time it hit and it bounced again, and then luckily it must have hit a softer area in a more advantageous rotation. So it actually landed this third time, uh, 
And unfortunately, we still don't know exactly where the lander is. It's been narrowed down to a roughly 100 by 50 meter zone. There have been very extensive searches with the OSIRIS camera, which is the highest resolution camera that we have. And we have, overall, over the majority of the nucleus, one meter resolution imagery. Yet, it's still very hard to know exactly where the lander is. The positional information that they have on the lander is from ROMAP and uh, CONCERT. CONCERT is a sounding experiment that actually emits a radio signal from the lander. It's supposed to go through the inside of the nucleus and do tomography of the interior of the nucleus. I'm uh, sorry, nucleus. So since we have the time of flight information for those signals from the lander to the orbiter, we know some information about the location of the lander. So this is actually the most recent uh, imagery I could find. Uh, and you can see all these beautiful plumes coming out, and I'll be returning to the top of the plumes later. So just to emphasize how little we knew before and how much we know now, we now have resolution of the nucleus that's so good that we can see the shadow of the orbiter as it passes over 70 centimeters per pixel. Before that, this is what we had. And now you understand why the video looked like what it did. Okay. Some of the Rosetta Science discoveries. Oh, that's not good. Okay, so I'm going to have to explain these independent of uh, the actual text. Okay, so the first major science discovery is from the uh, Rosina instrument, which is from the University of Bern. And in this instrument, they study the different vapors that are coming off of the nucleus. And so in particular, they study the water coming off the nucleus. Those of you who remember your chemistry and your physics, you know that there are different isotopes of hydrogen, and they result in light and heavy water. The ratio of those isotopes is a fingerprint to the source of the water. So the ratio of those two isotopes in occurrence of the water from Chiriyama and Grasimenko does not match the Earth. Therefore, there was a leading theory that Kuiper Belt objects in this early bombardment period of the solar system were the source of water on the Earth. That's no longer the leading theory because of uh, the Rosetta discovery. Second, uh, from the ROMAP instruments on board the Finlay lander, we detected that there's no magnetic field on this comet. There are some people who previously believed that magnetism was very essential to the formation of the early solar system. That's no longer a leading theory. Uh, third, we used to think that the way that the comet's gas came out is that photons from the sun hit these uh, carbon dioxide and water ice on the, the, the nucleus and directly caused that to uh, be emitted and caused the tail that we see. From ALICE measurements, which is from the Southwest Research Institute with Alan Stern, the PI, we now know that that's not the case. Instead, uh, instead, photons hit H2O in the nucleus and release electrons, and those electrons then spread in a reaction to the other H2O and CO2 on the surface. So this is a very different mechanism for emission of the coma tail. And then finally, just yesterday, there was a press conference and Jean-Paul Biebring announced that the Philae lander has detected uh, molecules of a size which is very consistent with them being organic molecules. This is, of course, very important to the origins of life on Earth, the leading theory, in fact, that these complex hydrocarbons and organics came from comets is thereby at least strongly suggested, if not confirmed. So these are just some of the science discoveries that we have from the Rosetta mission. There have already been two special issues of science, as well as well, one of uh, astronomy, and I always forget what the second A stands for, the uh, ANA journal. And it's a, always a good sign when the first special issue of science came out before actually the Rosetta mission even began its sci primary science mission. Uh, this is an example of uh, an OSIRIS map of the different composition of uh, the surface of, of Tria Mamparasamenko. Okay, so now I've told you a lot about the Rosetta mission. Now I'm going to tell you about the, the process of planning the mission and planning the observation. Now first I want to start off by saying it's not actually planning, it's scheduling, as an AI person would call it. Uh, for some reason in the aerospace industry they call it planning. In the AI uh, world, we would call it scheduling. And I'm going to start off with a disclaimer here. So there's the Rosetta mission, and a small part of it is what's 
called the SGS, the Science Ground System. That's divided into the downlink and uplink portion. And part of the uplink portion is what's called mission planning. And part of that is called RSSC. And I'll emphasize this is not to scale. So I'm going to be talking pretty much exclusively from here on about the RSSC scheduling system because that's the AI part, okay? I don't want anybody to have any misconceptions and think that that was the majority of the mission. Okay, so, space mission planning, what really is it? Well, if I was going to talk to an AI person, I would say it's a huge multi-objective optimization problem with hundreds of dimensions. And the end users can't even specify their objective function over these dimensions. But they will certainly volunteer and not hesitate to tell you when they don't like the plan your system is generating. There are some hard constraints, like operations constraints, you can't do things that would endanger the spacecraft, but mostly they're soft constraints. We have a joke, which is a hard constraint is a soft constraint that they haven't yet realized they want to relax next week. The plans are divided incrementally. You start with very abstract plans and you subsequently keep refining them. Uh, our general approach that you're going to be hearing about is we model all the hard constraints, we model many of the soft preferences, but we certainly do not try and model like these across objective transfer functions. And I'll give you some examples of that. Uh, 